The next item of business is stage one debate on motion 15169 in the name of Ash Denham on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland Bill. May I ask those who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons and I call on Ash Denham to speak to and move the motion for up to 11 minutes, please Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I'm very pleased to be here today to open the debate on the general principles of the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland Bill. I'd like to thank the convener and the members of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for their insightful scrutiny of what is quite a technical, detailed and in places complex bill at stage one. I welcome the committee's positive support for the general principles of the bill as set out in their report. And I'd also like to put on record my thanks to the Finance and Constitution Committee and also the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee for their additional scrutiny and consideration. Like the Economy Committee, I too am grateful to all those who provided evidence on the bill. And finally, I'd like to thank the Government's Actuaries Department whose analysis and expertise has been invaluable in informing the bill. For some time, the personal injury discount rate has been the subject of criticism. Prior to 2017, concerns were raised by pursuer representatives that the rate was effectively undercompensating pursuers and a judicial review had been sought. Since the latest change, criticism has come from defender representatives and insurers on the basis that setting the rate by reference to returns on index-linked guilts intrinsically overcompensates many pursuers. There have also been criticisms relating to the duration between reviews, which have contributed to the scale of impact of any change, and concerns have been expressed about a general lack of transparency in the process. When we consulted about this issue in 2017 and asked if the present law on how the discount rate is set should be changed, 78% of respondents agreed that a change was necessary. Problems with my paper here a little. Some common concerns emerged during the various consultations, which were about fairness, they were about clarity, certainty, regularity, and credibility of the method and the process for setting the rate. And the bill attempts to address these points. There were also criticisms relating to the duration between reviews, which have contributed to the scale of impact of any change, and concerns were also addressed about a general lack of transparency in the process. When we consulted about this issue in 2017 and asked if the present um, sorry, um, methodology and what the bill would do. The bill would put into place a new statutory regime for calculating the discount rate, which should be applied to future pecuniary losses for personal injury cases. In providing new methodology, the bill requires the government actually to assume that the damages awarded for future loss will be invested in a notional investment portfolio comprising set classes of investment asset. The portfolio has been designed to match the objectives and the characteristics of the hypothetical investor also identified in the legislation. And it's very encouraging that the committee welcomes the additional clarity and transparency provided by having the method for calculating the discount rate set out in the legislation and that they note that this was a view shared by most of the respondents to their call for evidence. As the bill stands, the rate will be reviewed every three years. Currently, there's no statutory requirement for the discount rate to be reviewed regularly, and it's clear that this lack of regular reviews is detrimental to all parties. In consultation, most consultees agreed that the rate should be reviewed on occasions specified in legislation. Whilst taking account of the views of respondents, the Scottish Government decided that review should be carried out every three years, with the possibility of a review being instigated earlier if circumstances point to the need. This would provide a significant degree of certainty tempered with a proportionate degree of flexibility. Stakeholders have suggested that a three-year review, settlement of cases may be delayed if one or other parties anticipates a more favourable rate coming into force. They argue that a five-year review period would go some way to address this issue. And the Scottish Government's imperative is that reviews must be regular. In their stage one report, the committee set out their view that reviews every five years would be preferable to every three years. And as I outlined in my response to the stage one report, we've listened carefully here to those that gave evidence and to the conclusion of the committee 
that in the interest of finding the balance between flexibility and certainty, that five years would be preferable to three, in the words of the committee. And I agree with the conclusion of the committee on this, and we will bring forward an amendment at stage two to alter the frequency of review from every three years to every five years. Um, and the facility to call for an out-of-cycle review will, of course, remain. The 2017 consultation... I will. Daniel Johnson. I thank the Minister for giving way, and, and in broad terms I accept that point, but could she maybe uh, outline some detail around the out-of-cycle review? Because in a, in a regular five-year period, those assus uh, assumptions around investments can change very radically, such as at the turn of the millennium and uh, the stock market crash that occurred at that point. Ashton. Yes, the member makes a good point. And obviously, the, the point of this in general is to create um, conditions which meet the hypothetical investor and make sure they get the right amount of money so at the end of the term, the money is exhausted, they're not overcompensated, but they're equally, they're not undercompensated. And the member is quite right to say as well that um, economic conditions can change very rapidly. And that is why in the legislation, we have the facility to have the out of cycle review. So that should circumstances change, um, the Scottish government will be able to review um, either the methodology, the distance between the rates, the frequency and so on. All of that can be reviewed in order to make sure that it still meets the need of the hypothetical investor. So the 2017 consultation provided options for those who might set the rate, some involving ministers and some not. And overall, although there was more support for the options which did not involve ministers, um, the Bill 4 therefore provides that the rate will be reviewed by the government actuary and the court will continue to have the ability to apply a different rate should they decide to. The policy decision to place the duty to review the discount rate on the government actuary is consistent with and integral to the overall policy aim of reforming the law so as to make provision for a method and process for setting the discount rate which is clear, certain, fair, regular, regular, transparent and also credible. And the policy approach has been to regard the determining of the rate as an actuarial exercise in which there should be no need to exercise political judgment. The legislation will provide in an accountable way the framework in which the rate should be set and thereafter the mechani sorry, mechanics of determining the rate and that will sit with an appropriate professional and the Scottish Government thinks that this strikes an appropriate balance. Currently courts can only make periodical payment orders for future pecuniary loss resulting from a personal injury if the parties consent. But um, periodical payments can be an attractive option in certain situations providing a guaranteed payment year on year for the duration of an award. And the bill for the first time will require courts to consider imposing this periodical payment, provided the source of the funding is reasonably secure. Would the minister give way? I will. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the minister uh, very much for giving way. The, the committee had some concerns about the fact that the court could impose on a pursuer who, for various reasons, might not want a continuing relationship eh, with the defender and other, and other reasons. Can she comment on that? Ash Denham. Yes, I thank the member for raising that point, and, and we do take account of that. There are many reasons why a pursuer or a defender that a PPO may not be suitable in those cases, and we do recognise that. Um, but we also think that in, um, the court will take into account those, so that, um, both parties will be entitled to put their views about whether they see a PPO as being acceptable, and then the court will take that all into consideration before they make their judgment. Uh, Minister, could you remember always to speak Sorry. towards your microphone? Thank you. Um, the bill also provides for variation or sus suspension of PPOs and similar agreements, and I note that the committee would like the Scottish Government to bring forward amendments to attach more weight to the pursuer's views when a court is asked to decide whether or not damages should take the form of periodical payments. And I've set out the Scottish Government's thinking on this issue in my response to the Stage 1 report, and I will continue to give this um, issue further consideration. I also note that the committee asks the Scottish Government to outline how it will promote the use of PPOs beyond the public sector. The bill does, of course, oblige the courts to consider the use of periodical payments in every case. And again, I've responded to the committee on this point, and I confirm that we intend to progress this matter with the Scottish Courts and Tribunal Service, and we're also going to look carefully at the Ministry of Justice on what they intend to do on the same issue and see if there's anything that can be learned from that information. The report made a number of other recommendations requiring action on the part of the Scottish Government and I intend to touch on those in my closing statement, but I very much look forward to listening to the debate 
this afternoon and in the meantime I move the damages investment returns and periodical payments Scotland bill thank you I call Gordon Lindhurst to speak on behalf of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for up to eight minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I trust that all members present have read our Stage 1 report, which is a classic of the genre. Uh, yeah. <laughs> although Neil Finlay, I think, is on this occasion not present to, to ask me a question about that particular line. Now, whether or not the Stage 1 report falls within Mark Twain's definition of something that everybody wants to have read but nobody wants to read it, I uh, wouldn't comment. I'm sure the Minister will have read it, and I thank her and her officials for engaging constructively with the committee. Now, personal injury cases may seem small in number, but the impact for the individuals affected and their families is considerable. We are talking about catastrophic, life-changing events, compensation for which should be calculated in a fair and transparent manner. And that is also a matter of concern to those who pay the compensation. The Association of British Insurers said the current system was broken and saw the bill as taking a much more modern approach. They told us, and I quote, we are therefore very supportive of this legislation which changes the framework for setting the rate to one that bears much more relation to what, what happens in reality. And the Minister has helpfully set out the context and content of the bill, so I will focus my remarks on the findings of the committee. We welcome the additional clarity as to how the discount rate is calculated. The discount rate, I should add, being the adjustment to a compensation award to cover future loss. That welcome was shared by the majority of respondents to our call for views. However, with opinions split on the detail of the bill, pursuer representatives on one side and defender interests on the other. The pursuers felt that any investment risk added to other risks, such as the cost of care or of modifying accommodation. Risks the victim of injury would not face had they not been wrongfully injured. And on top of the risk or perceived risk in seeking legal redress in the first place. The culmination of these risks could, in their view, lead to undercompensation. Now, from the defender perspective, the concern was that of overcompensation, that any discount rate not reflecting the ordinary and prudent investment was unfair, and that adjustments to include higher performing assets would result in better returns. This, as they saw it, was a blunt instrument. Now, the committee recognizes that the calculation of compensation is not an exact science. So the approach is of a hypothetical investor with a notional portfolio for a theoretical period of 30 years. We have little information on actual investor behavior, but the point is not what people do in reality. The point is to provide a standardized approach that works across a range of cases. So the committee asked for more detail on keeping the 30-year figure under review. We don't always receive a response to a committee report before the debate, but we did on this occasion. And uh, we can only hope the minister's fine example is not lost on her ministerial colleagues. Turning to the discount rate, it has several adjustments factored in, and these are intended to reduce the risk of undercompensation. They cover inflation, tax, investment advice, and underperformance. And on balance, the committee is satisfied with this approach. We are also content with the role of the UK government actuary in setting the rate. This, we heard, was a technical rather than a political exercise, with accountability to be found in the setting of the framework for the legislation. Now, we were also told about concerns of gaming the system, holding back or pushing forward court proceedings to suit the timing of a review. One suggestion was to work from when the claim was raised rather than the date it settled. We asked the Scottish Government to consider the merits of such a change. The Minister's response was reflective, if rather sceptical, although she hasn't ruled anything out, and we appreciate that. 
for this is a complex policy area and the impact on both the pursuer and defender must be appraised carefully. Let's not lose sight of what this bill is about. The Association of Personal Injury Lawyers told us, the award of damages is not an investment pot, it is not a reward. It is a sum of damages to look after somebody's needs for the rest of their life. I turn now to the review period. A review in held in 2017 was the first for 15 years and the outcome of that was not well received by defenders and insurers. The discount rate as the bill stands would be reviewed every three years with a review of the portfolio preceding every regular review and a ministerial power to call for out of cycle reviews. The committee considers this to be a suitably rigorous approach and in the interest of balancing flexibility and certainty we recommend a five-year review cycle. And I'm pleased that the Minister agrees and is committed, as she has said today, to bring forward an amendment at stage two. On the matter of periodical payment orders, we ask that more weight be given to pursuers' views. Periodical payment orders, or PPOs, are regular installments paid over the course of time rather than a lump sum paid uh, on conclusion of a case. Now the Minister has said that she'll reflect on the matter and that again is welcome, as is her willingness to explore how barriers to take up of PPOs can be overcome. We thank all of the witnesses who helped inform our scrutiny. We are content the provisions of the bill are consistent and credible, that this change in the law balances interests of pursuer and defender. We look forward to further consideration of the points I've outlined and that the Minister has undertaken to look at in advance of stage two. The author Ambrose Bierce defined the future as that period of time in which our affairs prosper, our friends are true, and our happiness is assured. Now, his was, of course, a sardonic take on life, but the reality is, victims of personal injury face risk and uncertainty. They contend with trauma and long-term ill health, often for lengthy periods of time, resulting from catastrophic injuries they have suffered. They encounter a legal process that can often seem long drawn out. They should have a system of compensation that is fair, that is transparent, Deputy Presiding Officer, we commend the general principles of this bill. Call Dean Lockhart for around seven minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Let me start by thanking witnesses for providing submissions on the bill and for those who attended in person at the three committee sessions dedicated to the bill. As the Minister said, the uh, bill is technical in nature, but it is an important bill that makes provision for a new statutory regime for calculating the personal injury discount rate to be applied for compensation awards in personal injury cases. Under Scots law, the role of compensation is to put the injured party to the extent that a financial award can as close to possible to the position they were in before they were injured. When assessing the amount of a lump sum award, courts take into account the net rate of investment return that a claimant might expect to receive in respect of a reasonably prudent investment of that lump sum. This is referred to as the discount rate. And the committee heard evidence, as mentioned by the convener and the minister, that both pursuers and defenders want to see a more stable, transparent and a fairer method for setting the discount rate. So when looking at how the discount rate should be calculated, the bill takes into account a number of factors. First of all, the bill seeks to define a hypothetical investor and to calculate the discount rate by reference to the following assumptions. First of all, the hypothetical investor will invest over a 30-year period. Secondly, the hypothetical investor will invest in a, a notional portfolio, that is a portfolio made up of investments in a fixed class of assets. In addition to these provisions, the bill proposes a series of standard adjustments to be made to the discount rate to reflect the following, the impact of inflation, a deduction of 0.5% to represent the costs of tax and investment advice in relation to the investment, and a further deduction of 0.5%, which is referred to as the further margin, to reduce the risk of undercompensation 
to the party suffering loss. The bill also provides for regular reviews of how the discount rate is set and gives courts additional powers to impose periodical payment orders. Deputy Presiding Officer, there was general consensus between defender groups and pursuer groups across a number of areas, including the need to update the system, the need to increase the availability of periodic payment orders and to give courts further powers in that area, and the need for regular reviews of the discount rate. And on that point, the, the review of the discount rate, we are grateful for the Scottish Government following the recommendation of the committee to change the review cycle to a five-year cycle instead of a three-year cycle. However, the committee did hear different views in some particular areas of the draft legislation, and I would like to raise three of these areas where there was some lack of consensus uh, in the evidence. First of all, with respect to the notional portfolio, there is some concern among defender groups that the notional portfolio is overcautious and is too highly invested in fixed assets which offer a lower return compared to higher returning investment in equities. The proposed notional portfolio assumes that only 20% of the investment would be in equity investments, which is lower than a typical balanced investment portfolio. And this is important because historically, I, I, I will in a second, historically we have seen much lower interest rates on government bonds uh, compared to higher returns on equity investments. And I'll give way. Daniel Johnson. I, I thank the member for giving way. And I, I accept some of what he's saying, but does he also not accept even the language being used, talking about a portfolio of balanced asset classes, is language that many people being awarded these things will simply not be able to navigate. And that also needs to be taken into consideration in terms of our so-called hypothetical investor. Dean Lockhart. Uh, the member makes a fair point, and I think that's why the further adjustments we'll come on to are the 0.5% to pay for professional advice in this area to ensure that the injured person has all the necessary professional advice. I think that's an important part of the protection mechanism that this bill uh, puts into place. Uh, so with regard to the, the notional portfolio, uh, defender groups also acknowledge the fact that the government will have to, uh, through secondary legislation, uh, change and update the notional portfolio on a regular basis to take into account market uh, changes. So with some time available before stage two of the bill, um, we think it would be advisable for the Scottish Government to look again to stress test the composition of the notional portfolio to ensure that indeed it does provide the right balance of investments. Uh, the second area which attracted uh, some different views was the further margin adjustment of 0.5%. Uh, defender groups have expressed concern that this further margin, margin adjustment will increase compensation payments beyond the level of 100%, which is the, the general principle. They argue that a cautious portfolio, which is already baked into the legislation, is likely to produce overcompensation, so there's no need for a further adjustment to deal with the risk of undercompensation. Uh, in the policy memorandum relating to the bill, the Scottish Government itself does recognise that there will be a probability <laughs> of overcompensation as a result of the application of this further adjustment of 0.5%. And while we understand the government's approach to legislate in favour of a risk of overcompensation rather than risking undercompensation, we also have to recognise that this will come at a cost. Uh, the costs associated with paying more than 100% of compensation will fall on insurers and ultimately their customers medical professionals, the NHS in Scotland, and other public bodies that self-insure. I, I will in a second. This is something that Parliament should recognise as a matter of public policy. If the further margin, mar, further margin provision of 0.5% is passed into law, we have to recognise that it comes at a cost. And I'll give way to John Mason. John Mason. Yeah, I thank the member for giving way. Would you accept that, I mean, it is actually inevitable that some people will be undercompensated and some will be overcompensated. It cannot, it's not possible to exactly compensate everyone. Dean Lockhart. I, I think that's a fair point made. Although the the uh, vast majority of the evidence did uh, kind of side on the probability that overcompensation would be the, the likely result on, 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 uh, as a result of these new provisions. Um, presiding officer, the third area where there has been some disagreement relates to the assumption that the hypothetical investor will hold assets for a 30-year period. A longer period of investment would increase the likely returns and therefore increase the discount rate. And it wasn't uh, obvious from evidence given to the committee why a period of 30 years should be used. We heard evidence 
uh, to suggest that the average claim, the settled claim, could actually be much longer and uh, last around 40 to 45 years. This led the committee to call on the government to assess how the 30-year period would work in practice. And we are grateful for the minister confirming that her department will keep under review the operation of the 30-year period of investment to ensure that in, in reality it does not produce a significant divergence in returns. I'm literally about to wrap up. Um, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Damages Investment Return and Periodic Payments Bill is technical but it is a vitally important one for those affected and we believe this will provide greater clarity and certainty for everyone involved. Thank you. Daniel Johnson for around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, I too would like to begin by thanking the clerks and members of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for their excellent work at stage one uh, on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland Bill. And I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the, the many organisations and individuals who participated in the consultation process. And at the outset, I'd like to state that Scottish Labour welcomes the introduction of this bill. It's a bill that seeks to calculate personal awards of damages through the, the injury discount rate that is clear, certain, fair, regular, transparent and credible. Ultimately, what this bill is about is about providing security to those who have been injured through the actions of others, leaving them often with life-altering conditions and with substantial life decisions to make. So while members have already noted that this is a technical bill, at its heart, I think, is something fundamental and understandable, which is that this is about protecting vulnerable people and making sure that we have a system that is in place that is fair and equitable so that they can make the decisions that they need to in very difficult circumstances. Importantly, it's also about finding the right balance uh, so that our public bodies, and in particular uh, the NHS, do not incur unreasonable costs and liabilities. But there's also an important point, which is this, that undercompensating can also lead to uh, uh, many of those bodies having large uh, bills. The NHS, no less. It's if, if we undercompensate, if we uh, give people too little in these circumstances, ultimately the NHS, which often picks up the bill. So while Labour agrees with the broad principles outlined in the stage one report. We recognise that there are parts of this proposed legislation that need to be robustly tested as this bill proceeds through stages two and three. Um, and I'd just like to outline uh, uh, two or three of those briefly in the debate. The, the first of these areas that require scrutiny is the makeup of this notional portfolio that we've already heard about. Concerns have been raised that it is too cautious, too focused on fixed assets at the expense of equities, even though equities would deliver a, a higher rate of return. However, I think we do need to strike a cautious note, and in particular around this notion of a, a hypothetical investor. And while it's reasonable to assume that invulnerable people will invest, it is not reasonable to assume that they will become investment experts or that they should assume the risk um, or indeed be required to be speculators. Now, clearly it is not reasonable for them to uh, put their uh, 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 damage award under a metaphorical mattress, but nor should we expect them uh, to bet on the stock market and uh, 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 seek to base their future on that future speculation. This notional portfolio, uh, of course, would need to be updated regularly to keep up with market changes, but it is unclear if the Scottish Government or the UK's uh, Government's Actuary Department would be responsible for doing that. Likewise, it's unclear if the series of adjustments set out in the bill would be adequate to, to cover the cost of inflation tax and investment advice or under performance. And now these are all the things that I think we need to test as this bill proceeds. I'd also like to talk about the periodical payment orders, which obviously allow courts to, to make awards for future economic loss uh, 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 and make uh, payments in a, a periodic manner and therefore increasing their security. And indeed, we welcome that provision which can mitigate against some of the uncertainty associated with lump sums. And I think, in particular, for vulnerable individuals, that can provide welcome certainty. However, more weight should be given to the pursuer's views when a court is asked to decide on a PPO, and I think members have already raised this point. Ultimately, this bill should seek to empower those seeking compensation rather than taking away any more of their control. Um, again, on the 30-year period, despite evidence suggesting that the average life expectancy um, following serious personal injury claim with uh, uh, damages over 250,000 
is uh, 46 years. Um, the bill assumes a hypothetical investment period of 30 years. Indeed, in her evidence, the Minister stated that there is no authority uh, on which to base the, that figure. It was chosen merely as a useful duration that was neither too short nor too long. I think it's important that this period is examined um, and must be carefully considered so that we, we uh, 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 reflect a, a payment period that is uh, 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 realistic. Um, in conclusion, Labour welcomes this bill and supports the aim in creating a fair, transparent and credible personal injury discount rate. Um, while it represents progress, the bill is, is uh, far from perfect and the proposed legislation must be robustly tested and closely scrutinised as it moves forward. Changes in the areas I've mentioned today will help strengthen the bill to provide greater uh, security to those who have been injured uh, through wrongful action, whilst also protecting public bodies from unreasonable costs and liabilities. It will make sure that we have a, a just system in place, a system that is fair and equitable. I look forward to following its progress uh, as we proceed through second and third stages. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank Minister. you, Mr Johnson. Uh, open debate, generous four-minute speeches. I call on John Mason to be followed by Maurice Corrie. Mr Mason, please. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. This has actually been a more interesting bill than I think some of the members of the committee uh, might have anticipated. It may be a relatively small number of people who are affected, but how compensation is calculated is of immense importance. The whole question of a lump sum settlement and how that will be invested is a very tricky one. There seems to be widespread agreement that the present system based on indexed linked guilts needs modernizing while keeping intact the fundamental principle of 100% compensation so that neither party should gain nor lose. As an aside, on the question of guilt, it seems to me that there is something fundamentally wrong when a saver gets a lower rate of interest than inflation. However, I accept that as a wider question beyond the scope of this bill. Overall, I certainly agree with the government approach that we should move towards a cautious but low-risk portfolio. We have heard evidence from defenders, which includes insurers and the NHS, of the risk of overcompensation, and clearly that would hit the premiums of others taking out insurance or would hit the public purse in the case of the NHS. However, evidence from pursuers spokespeople raised the risk of undercompensation, and that is certainly not desirable when a person may have suffered horrendous, life-changing injuries. In practice, a perfect balance with no risk of over or undercompensation is impossible to achieve, as there are always going to be uncertainties in these cases, for example, with someone living longer and some shorter than had been expected. The government has argued that we need a standardised approach, and I think most witnesses and the committee agree with that. However, there are always going to be disagreements as to how a hypothetical investor will invest their lump sum, and whether the assumption of a 30-year period is reasonable, as others have indicated. And I think it is welcome that the government has indicated that they are open to more than one rate if that seems to be needed for example, by having a 50 and a 50 year rate as well. Particularly contentious, as others have mentioned for the defenders, has been the further margin adjustment of 0.5% on the discount rate. On the one hand, this is seen as reducing the risk for the injured party, but on the other hand, it is seen as moving away from the concept of 100% compensation, no more, no less. We heard that the injured party or pursuer does take on a range of risks, including living longer than expected, higher inflation, or stock markets plunging as they did in 2008. On the other hand, if investments do very well, the pursuer might gain. Another very interesting area, which I think uh, my colleague Angela Constance is going to touch on, is periodical payment orders, or PPOs. The discussion focused on whether we should move away from the current position where PPOs only happen when both parties agree. As an outsider looking on, PPOs can seem to be a very attractive option as they take away some of the injured party's risk, for example, of living longer than expected. However, we did hear arguments against PPOs, including uh, the pursuer not wanting an ongoing relationship with the defender, the financial solidity of the defender or the lack of it, possibly restricting the pursuer's need to present, spend more up front, for example, in relation to accommodation, and defenders may not like them as they add uncertainty their, to their own financial position and in particular to their financial statements. I think the committee was reluctant to go the full way of giving the courts complete autonomy in this,
which is why conclusion 10 suggests an amendment that would provide for statutory presumption in favour of the pursuer's preference. I note the Minister's reluctance to limit the Court's ability to make the best decision, and I think this is a point we need to consider more after today's debate and at stage two. So in conclusion, I think there is general support for this bill. The Economy Committee supports the general principles of the bill, and I'm happy to align myself with that position. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mason. I call Maurice Corrie to be followed by Angela Constance. Mr. Corrie, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I, too, along with my colleagues, welcome stage one of this bill to Parliament. Uh, suffering personal injury is never expected, and no one ever wants to be in the position where they must claim compensation for industry injuries caused by wrongful behaviour. Through no fault of their own, these individuals can find themselves in the midst of conf a confusing legal framework that does not always work in their favour. But it goes without saying that the framework for these cases must not only be in place, but operate as clearly and fairly as possible, most definitely for the pursuer, but also for the defender. This is how we can ensure that these individuals are treated sensitively and by a credible system. We can see that the current personal injury discount rate needs improvement. With a lack of frequent reviews, we have a process that can seem ambiguous and unclear to pursuers and defenders in these civil action cases. So I hope that the introduction of this bill will see a helpful adaption of how the personal injury discount rate is calculated with careful consideration of periodic, periodic payment orders and how best to set the rate of return. I offer my appreciation for the work of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee and its work generally. Its, in, its insightful analysis of the bill has offered the scrutiny that is needed and I hope that its recommendations will help to further mould this bill and make an end result that works for everyone. I am in no doubt that the elements contained within the bill are well intentioned. The aim to make the current calculations of allocating compensation fairer and more efficient is clearly a necessity. Indeed, it can be a technically murky process for claimants, especially when they are facing what can be a very stressful period of uncertainty. We know that, the few, that a few uh, personal injury cases need a discount rate applied, but it is fundamentally still that the legal framework is absolutely clear for individuals and their family members, not to mention for defenders and their representatives. Making the legislation this as clear as possible is in everyone's interest. And I support the ways in which the bill will modernize exactly how compensation is calculated. It allows for adjustments to be made to the discount rate and opens the possibility for periodic payment orders or PPOs to be changed in certain circumstances. Whilst there are varying opinions on how beneficial this will be, the, opinion, the principle behind these methods is most welcome. I believe this bill will be better attuned than current legislation as to how pursuers behave, especially regarding how compensation is invested Indeed, the idea of hypothetical investor, as stated in the bill, should encourage a more modernized framework that allows for greater flexibility for the injured party and also clarity. Of course, I believe there are aspects that are worthwhile to examine in further detail. And for example, the 30-year period for holding a pursuer's assets is for some lot long, lot long enough. Uh, yet I recognize that this measure is designed to cover a broad range of cases and will regularly be revisited, which I hope will be this case ne as necessary. There is also a question of the extent to which the proposed investments and reductions can lead to under or over compensation. Indeed, the principal aim is to reward full compensation, not more, not less. The importance of this uh, for those involved should never be underestimated, and neither the pursuer nor the defender should be placed at a disadvantage. And with this in mind, I hope that the end result of this bill will allow the adjustments that accommodate for the needs of each individual, and this will lessen the potential risk for pursuers and will reduce the likelihood of being under or thereby being undercompensated. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome stage one of this bill. And while further insurances and examinations on certain aspects of the bill would be beneficial, I echo the support given by the committee. Finding a standard that, could be, that can be implemented across the board, one that works for each case, despite their differences, is quite rightly our goal. And therefore, I hope that these proposed calculations for setting the discount rate will lead to a more credible and fair outcome for those affected by personal injury and giving clarity that each party deserves. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Corey. I call Angela Constance to be followed by Jackie Bailey. Ms. Constance, please. Thank you, President Officer. While the number of people directly affected by this bill is small, it is nonetheless crucial legislation and we should always remember whose interests are at the very heart of this bill. 
And it is the people who have suffered, say, an accident at work, or a birth that did not go to plan, or a lack of care or negligence by an individual or organisation, meaning that they live with the tragedy uh, of no longer being who they were meant to be or leading the life that they had worked for or indeed had dreamed of. And the Minister helpfully puts this legislation into the context of a wider programme of reform, abiding by the principles of clarity, transparency and fairness. And I will return later to the importance of principles. In the time that I have, presiding officer, I principally want to focus on periodical uh, payment orders because the committee heard substantial evidence about the risks victims of personal injury bear when compensation, particularly if received in a lump sum. Because no matter how good the legislation is, calculating an award for damages, particularly for future loss, is not and never will be an exact science. So the risk of undercompensation eh, can be minimised but never removed. And we also have to remember that damages are not surplus funds. They are meant to replace loss of earnings and future care costs. And Professor Vass advised committee of inflation busting care costs and the unpredictability of life expectancy and the cost of specialised accommodation. And all of this it points to the advantages of a periodical payment order. And the bill gives the courts for the first time the power to impose without the consent of either party uh, PPOs, crucially where the continuity of payments is secure. However, evidence from Patrick Maguire from Thompson Solicitors expressed concern about a victim potentially being forced to accept a PPO and how disempowering that could be for someone who has already suffered a catastrophic injury and endured a lengthy court process. And the committee recommended that the government bring forward amendments to give more weight to the views of the injured person and suggested a statutory presumption. And the minister, in her very transparent and clear response uh, to committee, said that she did not want to undermine the court's ability to make the best decision and the courts would inevitably uh, weigh up the views of both pursuer and defender. Now, presiding officer, far be it for me to be disrespectful to our learned friends of the judiciary, uh, but neither should we be too deferential either, as we know that little in life is inevitable. And that brings me back to the importance of principles. If we can't do a presumption, and I'm not convinced that we can't, we should at least put some robust principles in the legislation relating to the views and voice of the injured person. The precedents are there with the Adults with Incapacity Act and the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act, amongst uh, many other pieces of legislation, where in this instance, the Court of the Tribunal after weighing up all the evidence, taking all the views, makes decisions, uh, again in this instance, to infringe people's liberty, but do so under the very clear obligation to listen to the views of all those impacted and demonstrate a wide range of principles. So let's not add to the feelings of powerlessness and of not being listened to that are all too frequent in the lives of those with significant disabilities, illness or injury. And the Minister went some way to recognise this when she acknowledged that periodical payment orders would not be for everyone, as some people do indeed need that clean break from those responsible for their injury. And I'm glad that she gave the commitment in chamber this afternoon eh, to continue to consider this matter. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you very much, Ms Constance. I call Jackie Bailey to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Ms Bailey, please. Presiding officer, as a member of the Economy Committee that scrutinised the bill, I am grateful to have the opportunity to speak in this debate. Now, four minutes isn't a lot of time to develop elegant arguments, so I'll just... I can give you five. Oh, my goodness me. I can't guarantee there'll be any more elegant. But let me cut to the chase and focus on two areas. Firstly, the discount rate, and secondly, periodic payment orders. Now, I appreciate the Scottish Government's intention as other members have pointed out, is that there should be neither over nor under compensation for people made awards of personal injury. So the principle of 100% compensation is right, albeit it might be difficult to achieve absolutely in practice. But those responsible for paying out compensation, the defenders, believe that the government 
is actually being over generous in their calculations of what people with an award would do with their lump sum. Their view is that the government is too cautious in their assumptions and investors should perhaps invest more in equities rather than fixed assets, thereby potentially maximising their return. But of course, this clearly carries with it a level of risk that given the volatility of markets might be considered to be much too high. Those representing pursuers, on the other hand, say that any portfolio should be based on no risk investment. And whilst I'm minded to agree, I think the government's approach is sufficiently low risk and cautious that I think it strikes the right balance between the two competing interests. Now, if we're being honest about this, most normal people with a personal injury award have probably never considered an investment portfolio before. They will naturally err on the side of caution, wanting to be sure that they have a secure return for their money and that the money needs to meet their needs well over their lifetime. I do note, however, that investors will do so based on financial advice, expert financial advice. But the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers welcomed the inclusion of standard adjustments on the face of the bill, but noted that the amount for financial advice and tax was underestimated. And it would be helpful, I think, for the minister to review this before stage two. The second area I want to cover is periodic payment orders. And I welcome this as many people with personal injury awards may have to live with the consequences of their injury for many, many years and will require varying degrees perhaps of long-term care. It is useful, a useful way of dealing with someone's needs over their whole lifetime, but is also flexible enough to be reviewed and adjusted if say a person's condition deteriorates significantly. But for some people with personal injury awards, the preference is to take a lump sum. That might be because they want to buy a house, they want to adapt an existing home, which all costs money, but it might also be because they have no faith in the organization making the payment because they may have caused the injury in the first place. Whatever the reason, I think it is important for the court to be flexible and a combination of both lump sum and periodic payment may actually be the best option for some. I would ask the minister to give thought to the committee's recommendations though about giving more weight to a pursuer's views when the court decides on whether to award a periodic payment order. And I am entirely with Angela Constance on this. I think it is disempowering to somebody who has faced that degree of personal injury to have that choice removed from them. Now I heard and listened carefully to what the minister said to John Mason, but I am not convinced that the government can't go further in meeting the committee's recommendation. It would also be helpful if she would ensure that if there is a requirement to vary a periodic payment order due to a change in circumstances, then the pursuer does not need to bear the court costs of doing so. I think that's an important principle we would want to clarify. Presiding officer, as others have said, this is a technical bill, but I think the Scottish government have by and large taken that balanced approach and in the main made the right policy choices. But I'm not letting them off the hook quite so e easily because there are, however, always areas that can be improved. And I look forward to the minister cooperating with the committee to ensure that we do have a fair and transparent system of compensating those who have suffered personal injury. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Bailey. I call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Mr MacDonald will be the last speaker in the open debate. Mr Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I've not been involved in this bill thus far, uh, but a number of aspects uh, uh, of it, and Jackie Bailey has touched on some of them, and I'll develop uh, some of those points later. A couple of points uh, that, I, that I want to address. Gordon Lindhurst, uh, as the convener, uh, indicated the balance between pursuer and defender and the different views there can be. It, it's worth saying that the phrase hypothetical investor is quite a good one because most people who will be in receipt of the kind of compensation we're talking about here are not knowingly investors in anything. They are investors, of course, very often via their pension, but with realizing they are. Uh, many people have 
industrial life insurances, which were traditionally sold door to door, the money collected uh, every week, or they might have a life policy. Uh, I myself had one that I took out in 1975 and took the money out of 31 years later, almost exactly the period we're talking about, and the discount rate, I've just done the sums, was just under 6%. But I haven't taken account of the value of the insurance part of that, which would make the discount rate a little bit higher. But of course, that was before the crash. And discount rates now uh, look uh, rather different. But the bottom line is that the hypothetical investor about which we're talking is a pretty cautious beast, and rightly so. Now, looking at the construction of the bill itself, and uh, Jackie Bailey uh, used the phrase, no faith in relation to uh, periodic payments in the person paying. And I think that's, that's a fair observation to make. Now, the bill does talk about a court may not make an order unless it's satisfied continuity of payment can be reasonably secure. Uh, it then goes on uh, below that uh, to say that they must assume it's secure uh, basically when it's a, a government that's actually paying the money out. But the one thing that isn't, which I think might usefully be added to the bill, is that when the court decides that, that it's satisfied of a continuity of payment, it should explain why it is satisfied so that if there is a different view, that view can be challenged. Um, and that's a kind of technical point that, that, that protects the person who's in receipt of the, the compensation uh, payment. Now, there's been some uh, discussion about uh, the costs of tax and investment advice. 0.5%, um, I'm a little bit dubious. I actually have the feeling that quite often it might be a bit higher than that in the real world. So I'm not quite sure that the 0.5% is actually adequate uh, to cover that. I don't speak directly and certainly, but, but I think it's a question uh, that would usually usefully bear uh, some. I, I will to somebody who I think John knows Mason. more than I. John Mason. Uh, well, just to point out to him, we did have evidence to the committee, I don't know if you would agree with this, that perhaps the investment cost at the beginning would be higher and then less later on. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. I'm, I'm absolutely sure the member is correct, but of course that goes to the heart of how the compensation is provided in a lump sum at the front or in periodic payments. And of course the actuarial risks associated with the two is fundamentally different. Um, and, and indeed uh, when uh, Dean Lockhart said uh, a longer period's discount rate goes up, I, I felt I didn't agree. I think the discount rate is what it is and that's the actuary's view, but certainly the discount cost goes up as the, uh, as the period increases, rather obviously, because there are more years over which uh, the discount will apply if the presiding officer permits. Jackie Bailey. Just to helpfully supply him with this, uh, the discount, the rate he was looking for, um, it was uh, at the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers supplied us with this, that it's between 1.5 and 2% per annum. Stuart Stevenson. That, that's broadly what I would have expected, uh, so I'm obliged to uh, the member uh, for that. I, I just conclude, uh, presiding officer, by saying investors do come in all shapes and forms. I have, over the years, with my wife being an equity investor, we've twice lost all our money on a particular investment, and in 2008, my bank investment dropped by 96%. Uh, so being in the equities market does carry a substantial risk. And indeed, ultimately, the investor in equities is the very last creditor to get paid and in fact may find themselves paying in if the shares are not paid up in value. So, presenting officer, I think this bill strikes a very measured balance uh, between the various options. It's one which I've looked at only in the last uh, 36 hours for the first time it strikes me as a very sensible piece of legislation, which I should be very happy to support. Thank you very much, Mr. Stevenson. I call Gord MacDonald, and then we move to closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As the Stage 1 report states, a person can claim compensation if they are injured through the wrongful behaviour of another person or organisation. The role of compensation is to put the person to the extent a financial award can, as close to the position they were in before they were injured as possible. This damages bill 
is necessary, as the Association of British Insurers explained, the current framework for settling the discount rate is broken because, as a result of the damages framework and decision-making by the courts, the way in which the rate is set bears no relation to what pursuers do in reality. He then continued, we think that, broadly speaking, the old framework is broken and this new framework is a significant improvement. However, there are issues that need further consideration in this bill, especially in relation to lump sum payment adjustments and periodic payment orders. It's a legal principle that a successful pursuer should receive 100% com compensation, no more and no less. However, in order to do so, broad assumptions are being made in relation to life expectancy, future care costs and economic conditions. The vast majority of claims are settled by a lump sum payment that has to support an individual for 30 years or more. As a result, the bill requires a series of set adjustments to be made to the rate, calculated on the basis of the hypothetical investor investing in the notional portfolio. These are the impact of inflation, a deduction of 0.5% to represent the cost of tax and investment advice, and a deduction of 0.5% to reduce the risk of undercompensation. The Association of Personal Injury Lawyers highlighted that on the standard adjustment rate, two rates are proposed in the bill, one to reflect investment charges and tax, and the second to reflect other conti contingencies. The suggestion in the bill is 0.5%. The committee needs to look at this area in more detail because the information that we have received suggests that the investment charges and the tax costs could be anything from 0.5% up to 1.5% or 2%, end quote. Part two of the bill gives courts the powers to impose periodic payments. Currently, PPOs are only used in the most serious of personal injury cases, where compensation for future loss makes up a significant part of the award. There are only a few such cases per year in Scotland. Thompson solicitors expressed concern about a periodic payment order being forced on an injured person. They stated, when a person does not want a PPO and wants the choice of a lump sum, but the court makes a decision for them, it can often be very difficult for somebody at the end of what is often an extremely long road to con compensation as catastrophic injury cases inevitably are. The process of finally getting compensation is ultimately empowering, and a decision that is forced on a person in many ways disempowers them a caution against creating a situation whereby the decision can be forced on a victim. That is not necessarily the case for insurers, but a victim wants a PPO, they ought to be able to argue for that and a court can make a decision irrespective of an insurer's view. In future, if more personal injury cases result in PPOs being awarded, then consideration must be given to how people's changed housing circumstances can be funded. A person seriously injured may be forced to move home or require an extension to be built to their existing home. If they remain in their existing home, then they may require adaptations to their house from ramp access, wider doors, lower kitchens, or the installation of a wet room, all of which require a capital sum. And if a periodic payment order is being imposed, then depending on the size of the PPO award, they may not have the funds to meet the cost of the alterations. As Jackie Bailey has already stated, there may be a need to have a combined financing model in order to meet upfront housing costs. While I welcome the provision of the bill, including the greater use of PPOs, the concerns of pursuers or the representatives must be considered in moving forward. Thank you very much. And I now move to closing speeches and I call Daniel Johnson. Mr. Johnson, give you six minutes, please. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I do apologise for members. They're getting a, a double whammy from me this afternoon, and I hope they don't seek damages as a result. Um, but uh, I'm working on the humour, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, uh, my New Year's resolution. Uh, I'd just like to make a few brief remarks uh, reflecting on the comments uh, of this afternoon's uh, debate. And I think first and foremost, I think uh, what we've heard uh, loud and clear right the way across the chamber is the need for us to understand the, the requirements of the individual, the circumstances that people find themselves when they're awarded these dam uh, damages are very often life-changing and catastrophic. 
uh, the considerations people are having uh, to, to, to make, you know, such as we just heard um, from Gordon MacDonald in terms of uh, changes to the, their homes, or indeed um, uh, we also heard from Angela Constance thinking about uh, essentially having to consider not living the life uh, that they expected to live. And I think that was uh, very well put. So the, the question, therefore, is what is reasonable for that individual to have to consider? What is reasonable in terms of the decision-making that we're asking them to make? Just why I'd like to touch uh, on, on, on the, the, the hypothetical investor. And I think Dean Lockett set out well the, the, the rational considerations that we might expect someone to make uh, in terms of that notional investment portfolio and the balance that that, that might uh, uh, take. But I do think we, we need to ask ourselves, both in terms of what is the general understanding of investment and what decisions might people make. And, and I would gently put it that, that people in these circumstances might not always make the most rational decisions. They're certainly going to be cautious, and we heard that from a, a, a number of, of members. But the hypothetical investor in this situation is quite different. And I think we need to be considering, as this bill progresses, are we dealing with the average or reasonable investor, or do we need a, a, a portfolio which actually also accommodates the unreasonable individual, the vulnerable person who might not make quite the right decisions? And I think in terms of, we've discussed a great deal this afternoon, in terms of getting the balance right between under and over compensation, can I gently suggest that perhaps we should be seeking to err on the side of overcompensation rather than under to accommodate those things. And I know that that is part of the calculation process, which brings me on to that point. And indeed, I think John Mason, uh, and I think some of his uh, remarks, I think, uh, illustrated, I think, some of the challenge. In the la if you look at in the last 20 years and what a reasonable investor might have done, that has altered quite dramatically in quite short spaces of time. There was a time when gilts were absolutely seen as kind of rock solid, um, a, a no-brainer investment, and that has uh, been turned on its head uh, and in quite short periods of time in the last 20 years. Likewise, the equities market has uh, been back and forth within my adult life. And I think that the, 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 the requirement for the calculation to reflect those things and be agile is important. And so while I understand the arguments that have been made by the committee in terms of three years versus five years, I think it is important that we test that flexibility so that when circumstances do change, black swan events, uh, alterations in terms of those underlying market assumptions about what a reasonable investment looks like change, that, that it can reflect that change. Because in all of our uh, living memory, we have seen those changes. And um, I think that brings me on to uh, the, the adjustment factors. And I, and I understand that it is uh, impossible to put exact science behind it, but I do think we do need to test uh, both the, the amounts uh, factored in for investment and tax advice. That does seem to be on the low side at 0.5%. But again, that can change. We are seeing changes in the market as we speak with the increase of technology and the lowering of costs. So that does need to be reflected. Um, uh, I, I would uh, also just like to touch upon the arguments made by both Angela Constance and Jackie Bailey around PPOs. I think this is a really important point, something that I think has an awful lot of benefits and advantages for a great number of people. But we need to be sure that we are not being uh, overly paternalistic. I think the presumption um, against, uh, a presumption towards uh, the pursuer's uh, wishes, I think, is uh, hugely important. But as with much of this bill, it is clearly something that, 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 that has to seek balance. Because I also do instinctively feel that PPOs have uh, huge advantages for people with uh, uh, particular vulnerabilities um, uh, uh, and the need for that certainty, which a lump sum might not be able to provide them. I would also just make the, the point that for self-insured uh, organizations and institutions, um, public bodies in particular quite often find themselves, again, there, is, there are advantages to them in terms of uh, PPOs as opposed to lump sum um, awards. Um, my final point I'd like to make is just around gaming, which I think Gordon uh, Lindhurst raised. And I think that's possibly one of the, the key points to, to, that I'd like to end on. This is a, a bill that seeks balance. It's one that, 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 that seeks to, to speculate and understand against a myriad of different considerations. And some of those are not going to be predictable or understood. I think above all else, what I think is important is that this bill does strike that balance and has the flexibility to continue to strike that balance in the future, and I'll end at that point. Thank you very much, Deputy Treasurer. Thank you very much, and I've got.
time in hand, so uh, Mr. Halko Johnson, I can give you um, 78 minutes. I'm sure you can use them. 78? Uh, 78. Think, uh, Did I say 78? Oh, 728 minutes for the avoidance of doubt. Thank you for that. It's okay, Deputy. That's I, taken I was, up a little bit of time. There I, we are, I, I, I understood what you meant if others didn't. That's Thank fine. you very much. I like you, Mr. Halko Johnson. Proceed. Thank you very much. Um, I'd first, firstly like to join uh, other members of the committee in thanking our clerking team for their typical diligence in preparing and supporting uh, the drafting of this stage one report. And I'd also like to acknowledge the range of written and oral evidence that we've received as part of this process. And of course, extend my thanks, uh, thanks to all those who contributed to that. This evidence has proved extremely useful in the scrutinizing the technical aspects of the legislation and providing members with an understanding of how the current law operates in practice. The bill, of course, has two major components, provisions relating to the application of the discount rate and those relating to periodical, uh, periodic uh, payment orders. Near the beginning of the, our report, the committee recognizes a very simple concept that remains an important principle of our law. It is that the, the law requires that where a person or body has acted wrongfully, they are liable to compensate anyone who suffers loss as a direct result. This straightforward maxim has global appeal, while it is intrinsically linked with Scotland and our legal system, it also had considerable influence across the English-speaking world and even beyond. And in many ways, it gets to the, uh, the very essence of what we have been asked to consider in relation to damages. Many of the people who these provisions will touch on have been wronged, often significantly, and suffered considerable, and as Daniel Johnson highlighted, often life-changing injuries and harm. In many cases, these individuals cannot work or have their ability to earn impaired. In the most extreme cases, they may be entirely dependent on care and support for the rest of their lives. Well, there is a clear fundamental principle, the compensation of loss. How that compensation is exercised can be opaque. The pursuer, as the wronged party, is probably uppermost in all our considerations. And as Maurice Corrie uh, highlighted, no one wants to be in a position where they must claim compensation for injuries or um, accidents caused by wrongful behavior. Um, uh, however, it is incumbent for the reasons that members have highlighted that this parliament ensures an end result where the law, uh, w the law will, insofar as it's possible, neither overcompensate nor undercompensate. We understand compensation to be fair reflection of loss, but equally the committee has heard the dangers that overcompensation can cause. This is not a perfect science when we are considering a lifetime of injury, but we should at least begin with a solid regulatory frame framework that attempts to find that balance because overcompensation will have an impact. In a successful personal injury action against the National Health Service, for example, compensation is necessary part of righting a wrong. To overcompensate, however, is not about making a required payment, but about a direct transfer of funds away from frontline services. We know there are millions of pounds paid out in these cases by NHS Scotland every year. And as claims often take many years to process, the backlog of open cases against the NHS is expected to result in payments of hundreds of millions pounds over the years of course Daniel Jones I thank the, the member give, for giving way and given that he's got 78 minutes to speak maybe he'll thank me for it um, but uh, I just on that point would he also accept though that very often it's the, the the NHS that does end up picking up the bill if there's undercompensation because it has to bear the brunt of the additional health costs that that, 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 that that may be incurred when the individual comes back to them if there's an un, un, undercompensation Jamie Harker Jones I thank the member for that intervention, and I think he's right in a number of cases that it can be the NHS that picks it up. Not, not in all cases, but certainly, certainly in some. Um, in actions against business, the effects often extend wider. Inevitably, insurance bears the burden of payment in these cases, spreading the consequences beyond the defender and rippling through the wider economy. We should be rightly cautious in how the discount rate is applied in principle and in practice. Our recommendations readily acknowledge the importance of the rate to individuals and their families. And the bill sets out and the means by which it will be calculated. As some members have touched upon, we have considered the impact of 30-year assumed period, as well as the assumptions around investor prudence. The Minister's responses in these areas has been welcome. The committee recognises that almost all respondents uh, to our call for evidence were supportive of the provisions around periodic payment orders. And as Jackie Bailey and Angela Constance both highlighted, we looked at the flexibility available to pursuers and recommended that the Scottish Government consider approaches that will offer a greater reflection of the pursuers' views. The Minister has suggested this will impact the ability of courts to look at the situation in the round. 
and it will be interesting to see how these issues are considered at the latter stages of the bill. Um, I've already touched on some of the openings given by my colleague Gordon Lindhurst, um, but it was interesting to hear both him and Dean Lockhart comment uh, on some, uh, some of the areas where both the defenders and the pursuer groups actually agreed uh, um, and also disagreed um, on the bill as it went forward. Um, and Gordon, of, uh, as convener uh, of the committee, also highlighted that there is a little evidence of what the actual investor uh, does, but we were based uh, uh, in terms of a hypo hypothetical investor all the way forward on this. Um, presiding officer, the committee has made our recommendations that the general principle of the bill be agreed to. I do recognize, however, that there has been a significant divide in the evidence the committee has heard. This, we have uh, recognized, can be cruelly divided into arguments in the pure's interest and those in the defender's interest. I mention this solely as a caution, assuming the bill proceeds today that as an effective balance will have to be struck in any future amendments. In the minister's response to the report that the committee received last week, there is clearly, uh, there are clearly uh, areas still to develop. Notably, I welcome her commitment to further careful consideration in relation to calculating the discount rate with reference to when a settlement is reached rather than when injury occurs. While I accept some of her reasoning, there still potentially remains scope for gaming actions by extending out timescale for claims. And I will watch with interest how the government approach develops. Thank you very much. And can I gently remind members to use full names when referring to other members in the chamber? Um, I now uh, call um, Ash Denham to wind up half of the government. Minister, if you can, but you don't have to, till decision time, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I will try my best to get the timing right. Um, I've listened with great interest to the debate this afternoon and the contributions from across the chamber, which I think were very reflectful and thoughtful as well. Um, and I welcome the general support that has been expressed for this bill. The fundamental aspiration of the bill is to ensure that the fairness, clarity, certainty, regularity and credibility of the method and the process for setting the rate. And I'm very pleased that the committee supports those general principles and that the committee is content that the provisions in the bill have been framed in the interests of achieving that fairness and regularity um, across a range of cases and for both sides of the argument. And as the Faculty of Advocates have commented, the bill balances the interests of parties. It's clear that the committee and also in the chamber today in its scrutiny has recognised that the process is not an exact science. And whilst much has been made of actual investor behaviour, I very much welcome the view which I share myself, the point that it's not what pursuers actually do, but um, providing a standardised approach that can work in the interests of fairness, regularity and credibility across a whole range of different cases. Fortunately, there will be very few people in relative terms who will be affected by either the discount rate or periodical payment orders. But for those who are, for those who have suffered often catastrophic injuries which change their lives forever, this bill is incredibly important. I mentioned in my opening statement that if time allowed, I would like to turn to some of the other recommendations that are contained in the stage one report and I'll just address a few of those now. I note that the committee believes that there is merit in applying the personal injury discount rate which was in force at the time of the claim was raised rather than the discount rate at the time the claim is settled. And this was raised by Gordon Lindhurst in his speech. Um, in this way, the committee would hope to avoid the deliberate delaying of a settlement on either the part of the pursuer or the defender, it's sometimes known as gaming, when a change to the rate is anticipated in order to obtain a more advantageous outcome. Um, I have to say, I'm not entirely convinced by this um, at the moment, but I did listen carefully to what the, the member said. And um, he is right also to note that I haven't ruled anything out at this stage. Um, I will reflect further on this. I'll give it some careful consideration and see um, if there is a, a potential way forward on this matter. Um, the Motor Insurers Bureau was also raised in the report. Um, and in terms of undertaking to report back to the committee in 12 months 
on the outcome of our consideration of whether the Motor Insurers Bureau can be designated as a reasonably secure body, as I indicated in my response, I would be happy to do so. The committee also wanted to know more about what would trigger a move to more than one personal injury discount rate, and John Mason raised this in his very reflective speech. As I set out in my response to the committee, ahead of each review, the Government Actuaries Department, or GAD, will check the returns on the portfolio over the different time periods, probably at 10 to 15 years, and also um, a time period of 50 years. If the outcome of that exercise demonstrates a significant divergence in returns, that would obviously then point to the use of more than one rate for different lengths of award being more appropriate in the pursuit of the goal of 100% compensation. Would for, I would. John Mason. Thank the Minister for giving way. Is it, she mentioned 100% compensation. I mean, is she still committed to that principle? Because there have been some suggestions. I think Dean Lockhart feels that overall we're heading towards uh, giving more to the pursuer. Uh, I think Daniel Johnson suggests we're going the other uh, way and, and uh, there's too much risk for the pursuer. Does she feel that we're still getting this balance right? Minister. I thank the member for that question. And the government, we are committed to 100% compensation. And some of the other points that the member has just raised, I will come on to address later in my summing up. For both the choice of assumed investment period and the potential use of split rates, GAD have actually cautioned against setting out an approach that's too formulaic in this point, as um, that would be what they call, and this is their words, spurious accuracy. The interpretation of the outcomes will therefore require the use of judgment rather than the application of a formula. But I would like to reassure the Chamber that if the evidence points to the need for it, that I am open to considering that option. Some of the other issues raised um, during the debate, um, and this was raised by both Dean Lockhart and also Daniel Johnson, was the mix in the portfolio or the notional portfolio. Um, so in the 2017 consultation, um, a small majority were of the view that the most suitable investment approach was that of the mixed portfolio, balancing a number of low risk investments, because they believed this was closest to actual pursuer behavior in the real world. And it has been the result of extensive analysis, both by GAD and also by an investment research firm. So I'd like to assure the Chamber it has already been looked at carefully and tested as well extensively, and also that it will be kept under review. Sure. Daniel Jones. I, I very much appreciate the Minister giving way. I'm wondering what, what her reflections are on my point. Is it's all well and good coming up with a, a, a portfolio for, uh, for a reasonable investor, but what about the unreasonable investor and you know, safeguarding uh, vulnerable individuals? Minister. I think the member's right to raise that, but I think um, the member must also accept that this is a proxy. It is in, um, intended to apply across a very broad range of cases. And we also do <coughs> expect that the hypothetical investor, in fact, we um, expect them to do this, that they will take investment advice when they are looking at their lump sum. So we expect them to be advised and we expect them to take that advice and to use the notion notional portfolio for that purpose. Um, another issue that was raised by a number of members was on PPOs. And this was mentioned by um, Angela Constance in a speech, I think that reminded us all of, of why this bill is so important. And it was also raised by Jackie Bailey in her contribution as well. And I would like to assure the Chamber that I listened carefully to the points that were raised by both those members and other members on the point of PPOs, um, what more the government could do in order to increase their uptake and also the, the point that Jackie Bailey made about um, putting extra weight onto the pursuer's views on PPOs. Um, I'll reflect on, on those points and um, see what, if, what the government is doing could possibly be strengthened um, for stage two. So there have been, not unsurprisingly, polarized views on the shape of these reforms, essentially split along the lines of the pursuer or of the defender interests. And it is clear that whilst the principle of 100% compensation must and does remain key, there are many issues aside from the personal injury discount rate which can impact on achieving it. Any investment comes with a degree of risk and the Scottish Government accepts that there is always a possibility of under or over compensation. 
but I'm glad that the committee is satisfied with our approach, which is to apply adjustments to the aim at reducing the risk of underperformance and reducing the probability of undercompensation. The bill will also remove the exercise of determining the rate from the political arena, where there is the potential for pressure for external interests to attempt to influence the outcome. The review of the discount rate will be firmly focused on ensuring that those who have suffered loss and are awarded damages for future pecuniary loss receive the full compensation, neither more nor less. This should provide fairness to all parties involved. The government actually will publish his reasoning in pursuance of professional standards, along with a rate ensuring the transparency of the process. As the Association of Personal Injury Lawyers in their written evidence to the committee said, we agree entirely with the Scottish Government's approach of removing the possibility of political influence over the setting of the rate. There is no legitimate reason or necessity for political involvement. Setting the discount rate should be an actuarial task and not a political one. At the most fundamental level, the bill will ensure that reviews are carried out regularly, which should in turn ensure that the impact of change is minimised. Finally, the provisions around periodical payments, we hope, will encourage the use of periodical payment orders, as well as provide the courts with powers to impose them where they consider the circumstances to be right. So I thank the members today for their contribution to what has been an interesting and informative debate. I also thank them for their support of the principles of this bill. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on the Damages, Investment Returns and Periodical Payments Scotland Bill. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. Well, after decision time, we will move on to a member's business debate in, on motion 14126 in the name of David Torrance. But before that, we'll just come to decision time shortly. <coughs> And there is one question to be put as a result of today's business. The question is that motion 15169 in the name of Ash Denham on the damages, investment returns and periodical payments Scotland bill be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. And that concludes decision time. So we'll move on to members' business in the name of David Torrance. But we'll just take a few moments for members and ministers to change seats. <laughs>